Hi, today we are here to talk about Rurik. Um, and I am joined by Lynn Coles, who is an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a Rhetoric 306 class, and she is currently teaching a Rhetoric 309K. So Lynn is a wonderful expert on visual rhetoric, and I'm going to hand it over to her. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I like visual rhetoric a lot because it allows us to kind of explore different things um, in our daily lives, pictures, photographs, things that we encounter every day. Um, that make arguments just the same way that words do. And so I've got a PowerPoint presentation today that we're going to start in a minute um, that will help me explore kind of the, my, the four main aspects of visual rhetoric that I like to teach when I teach it in my uh, 306 and 309 classes. Um, so I'm just going to hit the lights and we'll start from there. All right. Um, I call this PowerPoint presentation argumentation by image because visual rhetoric does, of course, make um, many different arguments in the same way that words do by photograph or image or any type of visualization rather than just with words, although words are incorporated into visual rhetoric as well. Um, so let's go to the next one. Um, since rhetoric is just the study of effective use of language, um, and here effective means persuasive or any language that conveys meaning as you've already heard from previous classes, um, incorporating visualization into that is necessary because, like I said, so much of what we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives and in uh, public discourse is based on images. Um, images make arguments the same way as before. Understanding how they do so is an important part of rhetoric in general. Um, and so that's what we're going to be discussing today. So let's go to the next um, A good place to start studying visual rhetoric is with advertisements. Uh, this is Rosie the Riveter, who was um, an illustration created in 1942 for the uh, War Department in order to get women to um, get out of the home and work in factories in order to produce the resources that people needed overseas in order to win World War II. Um, the, the idea of a rivet is interesting in itself because a rivet is of course like a piece of machinery and also, um, so, so Rosie is producing rivets and she's also a, an integral part of the machine itself which, which makes possible the winning of the war. Um, so, I'm going to use this image to introduce the four main parts of visual rhetoric, which are context, audience, arrangement, and then uh, an analysis of the modes of persuasion, which you've learned about already, ethos, pathos, and logos, in relation to audience. Um, so, let's go through this one quickly, and then I'll bring in an example of the DREAM Act that we can talk about as well, since that's your topic for the next few months. Um, Alright, so the historical context of Rosie the Riveter, like I said, is in World War II. Um, there were also kind of new feminist ideas and other cultural movements coming out at the time to which you could incorporate some analysis of Rosie the Riveter. Um, within the broader controversy, she helped not only women think differently about women, but men think differently about women as well. It became acceptable after the illustrations of Rosie the Riveter came out for women to move outside of the home and become part of a larger workforce, which then um, kind of instigated other cultural movements as well as civil rights movements um, later in the 50s and 60s. Um, within particular publications, we'll look at some of these in a minute, um, Rosie the River was on stamps, she was on magazine covers, and all sorts of different cultural publications that were important in getting her image out, but of course, the audience that she reached was different based on every publication venue. And so since audiences vary so differently, it would depend on how you saw Rosie or where you saw Rosie that would, endure, that would kind of determine what argument she was making for you. So if you saw her on a stamp, then she might be making a larger argument about women's employment in the workforce versus if you saw her in a local women's club on a poster when she might be making a more feminist argument about just getting women out of the house and not so much about supporting the war. So moving on to audience is the next one. Um, this is a tattoo um, of a woman's calf from recent years. Um, and so Rosie on this woman's calf maybe is making an argument about a particular facet of a subculture um, like uh, tattooed women or I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but something far different from Norman Rockwell's image of Rosie the Riveter, which was on the Saturday Evening Post in 1942, or 43, I'm sorry. Um, and if you notice the difference between these two Rosies, Norman Rockwell's having come a year later, um, and speaking to an audience who already knows Rosie the Riveter, um, she has machinery in her in her lap now instead of just herself on on the stamp like over here. Um, she's eating a sandwich. She's definitely she's clearly proud of her of her, of her status in the workforce. Um, in addition to just displaying her strength and independence in the stamp itself. Um, 
Now, an important thing to think about uh, also when we think about audience is the arrangement of the text, which we'll talk about in a minute. And as you'll notice, as we go through each of these different four characteristics of rhetoric, or visual rhetoric, um, you'll notice that we're talking about each one in relation to the other, because it's always important to think about they're interrelated and how they each inform one another to help us get a bigger picture of what argument a piece of visual rhetoric is making. Um, so the arrangement of a text is going to, to, to vary, of course, based on the publication venue. So this is like a whole cover magazine. There's much more room to display the machinery and the different facets of Rosie's life versus on the stamp where she's much smaller and can only say like one piece of uh, one piece of dialogue here versus perhaps you know the titles and everything that come on the magazine as well. So the audience is determined by the arrangement of the text, by the publication venue, and the last thing to indicate about or to note about audience is that of course it varies so much based on who who, who is actually in the audience. So. The way that people read the argument is going to be different based on um, the different people that are looking at it. So audiences vary by gender, by region, by, by ethnicity, by religion, and all of these are different characteristics of audience that you have to take into account when you're thinking about visual rhetoric and how arguments are being crafted to appeal to particular audiences. Um, so let's talk about arrangement next. Um, the layout of a piece largely determines, not largely, is part of what determines uh, how, we, how we determine what argument um, a piece of visual rhetoric is making. So here we see Rosie right in the middle of the piece. There's lots of negative space behind her, and she's clearly emphasized her strength and her, um, and her, and her fitness, really, by her centrality within the piece itself. So the layout um, helps speak to, or it helps make an argument about the piece. Um, font selection and emphasis here, we only have one little bit of text in this piece, but it's very simple and it's declarative. It has that large exclamation point on the end, um, which means that it's a, it's a message that anyone can grasp and it's a message that's also very urgent um, at the time. And so color usage and emphasis helps emphasize, or helps, I guess, turn the focus onto Rosie herself rather than onto the background. Um, with the redness of her scarf kind of emphasizes the, the red tones in her skin and therefore her femininity, so she's still female even though she's also in the workforce and independent at the same time. Um, oftentimes with elements, or sorry, with visual rhetoric, not so much with this one, you'll have lots of different elements that come together to form an argument like graphs, um, pies, cartoons, illustrations, and whatnot. In this one, we just have the illustration of Rosie herself and the text on the top. And let's go to the next one. Um, I put interpretation here just because we've been doing lots of interpretation as we've been looking at Rosie the River, but it's important to note that um, all of these elements that we're thinking of, they, they do suggest ideas, and like I said earlier, they might suggest different ideas based on the characteristics of a particular audience, but interpretation is always something that's, that's going to be at work when we're doing visual rhetoric. Um, manipulated images are more popular now that there are CGI effects and lots of different ways to make videos and whatnot. Um, this is not necessarily a manipulated image, although it is an illustration, but it's important to keep in, in mind when you, do, uh, when you perform visual rhetoric, the fact that people can twist images sometimes to make them say particular things in particular ways. Um, we already talked about positive and negative space, but just thinking about the overall layout and design of the piece is also important when determining what argument it's trying to make. Um, so let's take these different characteristics and analyze them in terms of some of the modes of persuasion you've already learned so far. So in terms of the emotional appeals of the text, we talked about female independence and strength and empowerment. Um, and these are all kind of highly emotional ideas that are elicited within audiences when you look at Rosie. And therefore, um, her, argument of, or her argument about female positionment in the workplace is made by this notion of um, patriotism and strength and independence in the female workforce. Um, logical arguments made by the piece are, of course, if women work outside of the home, then the United States will win the war. That's the, the, the major line of reasoning within the piece. And then the ethical appeals in the piece are made um, because, of course, it's on stamps, it's sanctioned by the government, it's an idea that's popular, um, and also it's, uh, it's, it's urgent, as we noticed in that, uh, in that exclamation point at the end of the text on, on the piece itself.